Welcome to Random Fandom, a podcast for the jacks of all trades. Each episode, we talk to a different master of their craft. That's what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. Hit it, boys. Welcome to Random Fandom. Uh, we're going to have an amazing guest tonight. Uh, we're going to be speaking to Ted Haynes, uh, a self-proclaimed foam fabricator and amazing uh, makeup artist, costume designer, uh, and creature designer. So uh, let's just get right to it. Uh, welcome, Ted. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, Ted. Great. <laughs> this is fantastic. It's an honor having you on the show. Thank uh, you thanks, very guys. much. Fun to, fun to be on the show. And we're from all different parts of the countries and world. So yeah, I love I'm in Tokyo, the, world gotten, in California. the world's gotten a little smaller because we can do yeah. this. Now. It has, it has, uh, Ted, um, we've known each other, uh, just to, uh, kind of tie this introduction up a little bit. Um, I took your Stan Winston class on foam right. fabrication. That was how many years ago? Seven, eight years ago, maybe. 27. I don't know. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> I'll bet you it had been a good eight or nine. I'll bet. It might have been. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. I went up to California and met you and that was, yeah. yeah, got it, got the show around the shop and everything. That was really good. Yeah. And Derek, you took that class too, right? I did. I took the uh, foam fabrication that was the T-Rex head first. And then I did the Kaiju class. Um, yeah. And then, that was amazing. I love that. Which class did you do, James? Uh, I, I think all of them. <laughs> it was well, I, the one where I first met you. I think it was the creature where I was showing a lot of like techniques, and then you guys built a uh, each right. each uh, student, you know, built their own creature. Right. Yeah, that's and the you, monster class, I guess. I can't uh, remember specifically what it was called, but yeah, that's was yeah. I kind? Of, was I nice to you? You were. In fact, we became okay. such big fans of your work that uh, Tom Stewart and I made a fan page. <laughs> That's right. How Sorry, many people Jim. are on now? Twelve? Yeah. 14? Twelve and a half. At twelve and a half. Oh, yeah. yeah. So That's tell right. us um, what you do and how you got there. Because well, that... I'm, I'm, I'm what the industry calls a foam fabricator. Okay. So that essentially means taking foam, like upholstery foam or closed cell EVA foam that everybody's using these days for cosplay, you know, building armor and uh, axes and swords and whatever, uh, you know, weapons. Floor uh, mat so foam. What was that? Floor mat foam, right? More or less, <laughs> what everybody uses. Floor mat foam, yeah, my, my dog's barking. Um, but, you, but you use um, specifically- but yeah, so it's Taking foam. The, I was going to say the industry uses a specific L two hundred kind of foam. It's like a, a, a slightly industrial level version of that, correct? Right. I mean, we we basically use what's really handy, um, and you know, being in the LA area here in the San Fernando Valley, there's like very few places we get our foam from. We don't order it from overseas or across the country. There's a couple of stores, um, Atlas Foam is the one I get all my foam from now, which is what I've been getting it from for at least the last 20 years. Right. And so you can call them up and they have these large, what they call buns, and they're four foot by eight foot by four foot thick. And you can call them up and say, I need eighth inch sheets or one inch sheets or a foot, you know, and I'll carve a giant chunk of foam and, you know, things like that. But then they have, so that's upholstery foam which is an open cell foam. You, you'll find that in like um, cushions for sofas, um, right. pillows. So they have all these different densities of foam as well, not just one kind. The pore structure is different. It's more memory foam or upholstery foam or um, there's reticulated foam, which is really open cell, but very strong foam, which is what I make muscle suits out of. I do a lot of muscle suits and fat suits. Um, and then there's the EVA foam, which is a closed cell foam that resembles sometimes kind of like a um, styrofoam. But I try to explain it to people who don't know foam at all. 
if you look at your sneakers, like, uh, you know, Nikes or anything like that, the foam that's in the sole of that shoe, which mm -hmm. is kind of spongy, it's a lot like that foam. Or the foam you can buy at hardware stores. Over here, it's like Lowe's or Home Depot or any of those type of hardware stores. And they have the interlocking um, three-foot square mats for people to either stand on while they work or kids play on them in playrooms. And so some people use that, especially for cosplay. But the L200 foam that I get from Atlas, it's L200, L300, L600. The higher the, the number, the more dense the foam is. And then, you know, it just depends on whatever project I'm doing or what thickness I'm working on. That'll determine the density of the foam. So, yeah, I'm kind of a foam smith. I cut foam using air sanders and Dremel tools and grinders and razor blades and band saws and then basically glue it all together. So the way a seamstress would put together, or a tailor, would put together a suit or a costume or a, just a shirt in general, the same thing is done with foam where you have a pattern that gets laid out flat. You cut all of your different contours and shapes and glue those together and you can create any shape you want, an egg shape, a peanut shape, a ball, a, you know, any kind of shape, you know, once you kind of figure out the foam. Right. Um, so it's it's essentially like making clothing only out of foam and it would stand on its own. And it's now, follow it, right. Sorry, go ahead, Derek. I was going to say, following your builds on Facebook, uh, that's what you did for Frankenstein behind you. Yeah. Yeah, so this this guy right here, this is all foam fabricated. Um, so it started out as L200. So I created a pattern, and in the whole under structure is L200 foam glued together with barge cement. It's like a really heavy duty rubber cement glue. And then to get all the details, you know, the, the, the nose and the chin and all these nice little folds here and the eye bag, that's all created with upholstery foam. So you've got the very dense EVA L200 foam, and then on the outside is a skin. So it can be quarter inch foam or half inch or one inch, whatever I would need to create a shape like that. And actually the witch over here too, this is all sculpted um, out of a solid block of mm -hmm. foam. So I would get a large piece of foam. Let me show you something real quick. I've got a couple of these heads down, a couple of these heads down on the ground here. And so this is kind of the way it starts out. So there's these little, these little zombie guys that I was working on. And these are just kind of prototypes. So the, the foam's yellowed over time. Um, and that's just from age. Um, now, are those patterned or carved? What's that? Are those patterned or carved? These are carved. These are sculpted. So I'll use, at first, maybe a bandsaw to cut out the contour. You know, lay that on my bandsaw and cut that out. But then I'll start going in with a razor knife you know, like the, the retractable razor knives, and I'll chop at it some more. And then I'll go in with um, razor blades. They're called Persona razor blades. It's a long blade, about you know, two and a half inches long, really, really sharp. And then I'll start contouring everything and going in with little scissors and snipping out all the little fold lines. And like the ears are done separate, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll snip those out and glue them on. Um, you know, so all this is snipped up. But then if I want to go in even finer, I can go in with like scalpels or, or exacto knives or a Dremel tool and, and, and refine all of this. And so after I'm done with a, the shape like this, which is exactly what I did for the witch, I can coat this in spray glue and latex rubber and create all the little fine wrinkles and folds like I have here and actually the Yoda down here. I'm gonna I'm gonna be really mean to Yoda. Oh that's beautiful. You know, so that's all done with, with uh, tissue paper and cotton and latex rubber. So wow. Yoda started out just like that head I was showing. So that's all sculpted foam and um, you know his whole his body and his hands, all that was uh, that was all sculpted from a solid block of foam. That's and it, Gorgeous. It all depends sometimes, you know, how I do something. So that, this is sculpted from foam, and it's a solid block, whereas this was all patterned and is hollow inside. Oh, right. So, so somebody could wear that if, if they wanted somebody to. Somebody could wear that. I, you know, that was kind of the idea originally, as I was going to make this as a large mask. 
Um, oh, right. I just fit a helmet inside so I could slip it over, but I kind of like it as a display piece right now. Oh, yeah. And but I do have the patterns, so I could I could make another one of these. I patterned right. out every piece of it, so the understructure and all the skin pieces. So um, and, and you can make a big monster build of that as well. All this to sure. say is these are materials that anybody can get their hands on, and you can make right. literally anything with this stuff. Well, I mean, any kind right. of costume. You can't make a car with it. Well, and you know, the costume as well as you know, like um hard objects too, like like guns and axes, oh, like gun version armor and things like that. It all depends on what you coat it with. Right, um, right. I know I, I, I'm there's a lot of pictures I know that you guys can show of my work. Um, where I've done, a, a, there was a character I did at Legacy Effects uh, several years ago, and we had to do the old uh, style Bumblebee from the Transformers, mm. and it was a costume that was going to be worn. And again, that's all made out of L200 foam, so it's just closed cell EVA foam, and then it was coated with Plastidip, painted, weathered, and so it looks hard. It looks like it could be fiberglass or metal or vacuform plastic. But the budget, the, the budget wasn't there to build a suit like that, you know, for a simple commercial. Sometimes commercials clearly don't have the budget that a feature film would have. Right. And they also don't have the time. So fabrication like this really lends itself to doing quick commercials or cosplay or low budget filmmaking. Um, and that's really what I would get entrusted with at all the different shops I've worked with over the years. Where, is, where have you worked? over the years you and how did you get there actually I, I i've been in la here now for about 32 years um I, I moved out to la when i was like 19 20 years old um from wisconsin and uh you know it was just one of those things as a kid i just i knew what i wanted to do i saw star wars when i was nine years old and and said that's what i'm gonna do right there is make those monsters or build those miniatures or just do something and work in film and, uh, you know, I kept that up all through grade school and junior high and high school and um, took, a, you know, a little bit right after high school. But then I, I got in the car and drove to L.A. And my first job was with uh, John Beekler. Okay. And mm -hmm. if folks don't know who John Beekler is, um, uh, John had directed um, Friday the 13th Part 7, had worked on at least one or, or more of the Freddy Krueger films. Um, you know, this is way back in the day, did a, did a show I remember watching as a kid. It was a Saturday morning live action science fiction show called uh, Jason of Star Command. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was like a monster of the week type show where, you know, some creature alien would show up. But, you know, John's shop was responsible for building those aliens. So I looked at John, John's shop, John Beekler's shop, MMI, um, was a low budget shop. He worked on a lot of low budget film and TV projects. And honestly, it's the best place ever to learn. Um, there's not a lot of those shops around anymore because everything is just such high budget. Right. Um, even the commercials, every, everybody wants, you know, like they say, they, they, everybody wants Jurassic Park. You know, mm -hmm. everybody wants the best quality. Everybody wants Iron Man, you know, but um, so things still cost a lot, but um, there, there, there aren't any more of those like, uh, or not many of those garage shops where you could do some really great low budget filmmaking. And John, you know, you, I got, I started there. I was sculpting, I was molding, I was painting, uh, doing mechanics, uh, foam Everywhere. fabricating. That was the reason John Beekler hired me. You look at my book and you know, I wanted to be a makeup artist. So here's my picture of my makeup and here's some old age makeups and here's some zombie makeups and, Here's some character makeups and some hand laid beards and you know all that kind of stuff. And John goes, "Oh, you're a foam fabricator," and I was like, "What?" And he goes, "Oh, no, no, I love all your foam fabrication stuff. That's exactly what we need." And I was like, oh, "Okay." So you're and like, "I want to be a makeup artist." Foam fab, but so I got jobs that sort of chose you, huh? Yeah. What was that? I said the job sort of chose you. Absolutely, and I mean, I did foam fabrication back home in Wisconsin as a kid out of necessity. Because it's the foam, like I showed you, the zombie head or the foam for this, it's relatively inexpensive. I mean, you can go to any, any upholstery store, you know, coast to coast here in the United States, 
and get upholstery foam relatively cheap. I mean, nowadays they've got it at Michael's art, Arts and Crafts stores, they've got it at Joanne Fabrics. And then what average size town doesn't have an upholsterer of some sort, you know, to do an old chair or a sofa. And that's what I did. I, I went to the upholstery shop in my hometown. And they'll give it to you for free. They'll give it to you for oh, yeah, free. They, they just yeah. gave me foam. You know, they yeah. had all these offset pieces that were like, you know, one foot square or two foot right. square or not square, but you know, they're like inch thick by two foot by two foot or, and they would just give me all these scraps and they're like, oh, that's weird kid. You know, what are you doing with this? It's like, I'm making monsters. And they're like, that's, okay, the first, what? that's the first thing I did. I got, I, I got a bunch of scrap pieces and I made Popeye arms. It was the first part right. that I ever that's did. Awesome. Yeah. And I didn't know that that's what they use in the industry either. I just took a razor blade and it was, it down. My dad, uh, my dad was looking at me like, what's the matter with you, man? <laughs> <laughs> that's what all of our parents did. Now, I, I remember sitting in the living room at home when I was a kid making a Howard the Duck head. And I figured out a pattern, parts of the head and everything like that. But then the bill, I wasn't quite sure. So I got a, a decent sized chunk of foam from the upholsterer and I sat there on the living room floor, floor snipping it out with scissors, spray painting it orange and, you know, do, marking it up with Sharpies. And did, you, did your parents understand what you were trying to do? No. <laughs> My wife is laughing at me. No, <laughs> no, they were, but they were, they were encouraging. They knew I was an artist. They knew that I, you know, I could draw, I could paint, I could sculpt. And they always encouraged me as an artist. But when my focus just went so pinpointed at film, you know, especially monsters and creatures and doing miniatures and models, you know, they kind of didn't quite get it. They were both school teachers. Um, you know, so they're kind of, I, I'm not quite sure, you know, and then asking for a Super 8 camera all the time. I really want a Super, what do you want that for? I'm going to make monster movies. I'm going to make zombie movies. I'm going to make, so, you know, but they, I got my Super 8 camera. I got my, uh, you know, projector, editing bay and all that kind of stuff. And they bought it for me. So it's their fault. They encouraged it. <laughs> no, they, they certainly encouraged it. They didn't understand it. And I think it took them quite a while even after I moved out here and started working professionally for them to really understand what I was doing right so, tell us tell us that story real quick because we talked the other day and right I remember uh considering some of the films and things that you'd worked on your parents came out to visit you one time and they met Arnold I think and you had introduced well, they, 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 they came out all the time once I moved out here I think it took about maybe only like two years or so before they started coming out regularly. Mm. You know, they come out once a year or once every year and a half or so and uh, spend like a week in the summertime with me. And, you know, lucky enough to be able to be working on things and I would take them to the shops and, you know, from one little shop to another, I don't think they were at a John Beekler shop, but they were at Alchemy Effects where I worked with Mike Deek and they didn't quite understand. They knew what I was doing out here they knew i was making monsters they knew i was working in film and at this point building some costumes and i was working for a kmb effects group at this time and uh i happened to be working on jingle all the way with arnold schwarzenegger and i okayed it with the production and okay it with arnold and um you know just you know you mind if i bring my folks to set and back in the day i mean people just didn't really care about that stuff you had to ask for permission you know permission to do it but it wasn't like, this is a closed set. Nobody, you know, it's, it wasn't too difficult to get your folks on set. Well, there wasn't the internet at that time, right? No, there's no internet. There was no, you know, so nobody was really, you know, no cell phones pulling out of pockets, you know, taking pictures all the time. So, but I brought my folks on set and my dad was very impressed. He got to meet Arnold Schwarzenegger. So he got to meet Arnold. Arnold was very nice to them, you know, kind of stopped almost right in the middle of a take. and. Oh, I got to go meet Ted's folks because he saw him standing off behind camera with me. And, you know, I was kind of sheepishly pointing, there's Arnold over there. And that's what they're doing. And that's a blue screen. And that's the camera. And he was like, Ted, that's your folks. And he stepped down off the Apple box or whatever he was on and came over and got to meet them. And, uh, or they got to meet him. And then they met uh, Sinbad, who was in the movie as well, the, the comedian. There's a certain age group of people that are going to remember who Sinbad was and a whole other group that have no idea. So, 
<laughs> I think it's funny because you, all three of us are more or less the same age, maybe maybe two or three years. Are we? Ago. Yeah. And um, <laughs> say yes. So yes, we're all twenty nine, right? You guys. <laughs> you said you've been in California for you know twenty nine, thirty years. I thought, oh, you moved here too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. So, um, I'm seventy three years old. <laughs> Full of it. So, um, no, because all of us are going to have these kind of like, I don't you remember this? And we'll probably remember it. A lot of our listeners may be younger, or who knows, they may be our age and it's like all nostalgic for me. Yeah, send that. That was great. And somebody out there who's much older is going, Yeah, that's a great movie. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I got to hang out several days with um, that I was really excited with on the set of Jingle All the Way. I was with Arnold all the time. I was Arnold's dresser. So every time Arnold had to get into the, the, the Turbo Man costume that we had built at K&B, um, that was my responsibility. Plus, I dressed the stunt guys as well. Um, you know, there was two other crew members from, from K&B, primarily in charge of the stunt guys. I was always just Arnold. If there was a day that Arnold wasn't playing, um, that meant I dressed the, the stunt guys. But so I was always Arnold's guy. Um, but, uh, you know, so I got to hang out and talk to him and, you know, he would give me cigars to smoke and you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, but I also got to hang out with the peripheral people that were on set too, which was really neat because uh, uh, it was uh, Robert Conrad was on oh, that no. Wild Wild West. And oh, Black Sheep Squadron. Like that, and I got to talk to him about Wild Wild West and Black Sheep Squadron and all that kind of stuff. And Happy. he was just cool guy. He would just hang off on the side and never came over by Arnold because Arnold would always have like his. He didn't have an entourage, but you know it was Arnold and it was me, and one of his stunt guys would be right next to him that was dressed the same. And I mean, so maybe there was like five or six people all together with Arnold. You know, he didn't travel with a horde of people. Right. And like his makeup person stuck close and all that sort of thing so but then robert conrad and i was just sitting there talking days in a row and you know that would be a of, dream of mine he was really cool he just kind of hung back and you know but it's people like that that i was really excited you know i was excited for arnold too i mean of course i grew up with terminator and you know conan and you know things like that so yeah but see there's a level of like you you look at arnold and you're like I, you know even his physique you're just like that's some kind of unattainable comic book he's conan you know but you look at robert conrad and i grew up with him in my head as this image of what now that's a man that's what i aspired yeah. i wanted to be um it, his character in wild wild west and happy on black yeah. sheep squadron that was just like that's that's the guy that knows what's going on and gets things done that's that's what i want to be and so you i don't know you just got an image in here oh yeah i mean, i don't know how old he was when he was in jail he just passed away yeah i think like a week or two ago that's somewhere about there um and uh you know, but he was silver haired and older looking. But I mean, of course, when I was working at Jingle All the Way, I was 24, 25 years old. And he was probably the little bit older than I am now. He's probably in his mid 50s or something. But he sure looked like he could knock you on your butt if you wanted to. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah he passed away February 8th, 2020. Okay, so yeah, it was a little bit more. I don't know. This time that we're in right now, I can't, but, you know. What day we all is lose track of time. <laughs> yeah, it's this is we're recording this in, on April twenty third, twenty twenty, and uh, we're actually I didn't say this in the beginning, but we're doing this because we're all kind of stuck at home, and we want to inspire people to do stuff while they're at home. And you know what what's life going to be like when we're out of this? What can you do? Everybody can do more. Uh, we can do whatever we set our mind to. So right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Ted, you've been working on all this stuff while you've been stuck in the house. You've been like, you you and your better half both, you and I have both been making some fantastic things. I, like you know, people have said too, it's like every, you're, you're stuck in your home, you're stuck in your home. I left Legacy uh, about a year ago mm -hmm. to, to try to start doing my own thing and all that. So, I mean, when all of this came down with the uh, um, the pandemic, I don't feel like I'm stuck in my house. I, I We've got a really great shop. 
outside the house. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing. I just do what I've been doing for the last year, you know, get up and go out to the shop and work on this or work on that. And, you know, I've been lucky enough to this last year to work on a couple of film projects, you know, short films and feature films, things like that. So it, it hasn't changed for me that much. I just don't go to Target or the grocery store nearly as much as I used to. And I have to wear a mask when I do it. So, Hey, Ted, before, we don't want to keep you too long, but uh, because for, for James and I, it's really important that we have this inter, interconnected study system where one thing sort of informs the next and we learn from all these different disciplines. You're a builder and a performer. Can you talk a little bit about that? I, well, yeah, I'm a performer only in the sense that I'm a big giant ham. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just like my wife is nodding over here. I see her. And she's going, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> her head is like, Pop. yes, he is. No, and I mean, I always enjoyed when I was in high school and junior high, I was in the theater department, but I never wanted to be on stage unless I was in a costume. Hmm. You know, I, I'm fine be on the sides, you know, behind the curtain. You know, and that carried over into my film work, too. So, um, you know, my first jobs with John Beekler, I was under a raised floor with my hand through doing a puppet, doing rods, things like that. If I was a puppet, I was great, you know. And then it started to progress into being in the creature suits. Mm -hmm. You know, typically that's reserved for guys who are well over six feet tall, you know, six and a half really, feet, really skinny. seven feet, you know, you start looking at like the, the Peter Mayhew from Star Wars or, you know, like, Doug, Kurt, Jones. You know, like yeah, Doug, Doug Jones or Brian Steele or, or Doug Tate or Derek Mears. Those guys are all like six and a half feet tall. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you have to be on the other spectrum where you're under five feet tall. Right. You know, like, you know, you or start going famous. the smallest, you know, like Vern Troyer or, um, uh, Debbie Carrington and people I've worked with like Missy Roses and you know so I'm 5'10 so I'm like very average type guy but I'm fairly decent on walking on stilts or if they don't need a really big tall creature or if it's in a weird predicament or something like that and they don't need a tall fella they can stick me in that suit so I started getting into that I've always liked performing but performing from inside of a costume is a lot of fun because all of a sudden, if, I, if I'm in, inside of a costume, for whatever reason, I'm a tap dancer, you know, all of a sudden I just start, you know, doing a little jig and I'm like tap dancing or doing a jig or, you know, being some, you know, doing something stupid, you know, but yeah, I've, I've worn a lot of creature suits in primarily in um, commercials. Hmm. So all my years at Legacy and Stan Winston's studio, I started at Stan Winston's. I got to work with Stan for about four years before he passed away. Right. And uh, so I was starting to be in creature suits then, you know, for the commercials, you know, Chef Boyardee commercials and Orkin commercials, or I was puppeteering externally, you know, wearing a blue screen or green screen suit, um, you know, puppeteering like the Geico pig or, you know, things like that. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been in a lot of different suits. So and it, it helps that I'm a little bit, not that I'm short, but I'm, my center of gravity is not as, you know, so I can get on stilts and I can, you know, uh, I can, I can right. work. You, get, you yeah. get too tall and you just get that. You get yeah, the tall guys aren't good on stilts. They're, they're just good being tall, you know. Go ahead, there. No, no, I was just going to say, I would think that would make you very sympathetic in your builds because you know what it oh, feels like to be absolutely. inside. I, I always tend to say, like, when I'm in the shop or working with, with people that are building costumes or I'm in charge of building something or even just working with people building, I build from the inside out. I know that there's a person inside of there, and it starts with that person. So, you know, mechanics always want to pile on, a, a, you know, 20, 30, 40 pounds of junk, you know, and you have to make this work as well. It has to have the animatronics to move the face to move the hands and all this kind of stuff, but sometimes it's not practical or it has to work in a certain way. And it's like, no, that a guy's head is going to be there. You can't have the mechanism for the jaw there or the eyes can't be, you know, because no, the person's head is going to be there and they have to be able to see 
They have to be able to breathe. So I build from the inside out. It has to be comfortable. And it doesn't matter if I'm in the suit or somebody else is in the suit. It's got to be comfortable because number one, if the person isn't comfortable inside of the costume, you're not going to get a performance. Right. They're always going to be tired. They're always going to be, you know, it's like, oh, this really is sore over here. So they're not going to be able to act as long in the costume. They're going to need more breaks. They're going to need to get the head off. And sometimes taking these heads off, it's unplugging batteries, unplugging receivers, um, undoing all the stitches, all the um, snaps. You know, sometimes right. there's 80 snaps that go around a giant head or, you know, getting them out of the back and zippers and fast buckles and all that sort of thing. So it has to, it has to work first with the performer he right. has to he or she have to be able to perform the costume you know the, the character and make it look believable wow and okay. sometimes it's horribly uncomfortable i mean i've, I've seen guys like brian Steele and, and Derek mears that when we did um zathura at stan winston's and they played the zorgon creatures His tail was crazy heavy holy smokes heavy they're, they're, tail, they're right? sticking out of the back so they yeah. wore green screen hoods. And I mean, that had have been great for them just to be able to keep their heads cool. Oh, um, yeah. You know, literally cool, you know, temperature wise, so they can get the heat out. And the, the head of the creature came off the chest and straight out. Huh. And then the tail, you know, so their body was in the center of the creature. And it, but the heads were all animatronic moving around. They, they, that whole suit had a way I'm going to guess anywhere from 80 to 120 pounds. Oh, man. Not to mention they were on lifts as well. They're, yeah. they're, they, they, they wanted to look like they had like a dog leg. So they had that, that curved leg and they were on lifts. So they were on tall, like eight inch lifts, whatever you saw the whole creature. Mm -hmm. So they had to be on lifts with these animatronic tails coming off of them with the heads. And you had these servos that were turning the heads quickly and whipping the tails quickly. And then they had a balance on eight inch lifts. Wow. Like, mm -hmm. Just crazy. Just yeah. crazy. Luckily, I never had to do anything like that. Usually any character I've been was either flat footed or suspended. So mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about my balance. I was just being suspended by a rig or I could just be flat footed, you know, with big floppy feet on. You, I'm always playing a character that's really big and dumpy with giant feet that I have to kind of run across the lawn or a set it. That would be me without a costume on. <laughs> Big and dumpy. Um, so you were, did you meet uh, your wife over at Stan Winston or Legacy? Yeah, at, at Legacy, yes. Um, my she's, she's off camera now. Bring, bring her on. Yeah. Bring her on. Introduce your better half there. I'm, I'm reaching off camera. Pull. <laughs> There. Oh, other side. It was a perfect effect. Hi, guys. Hi. So this Hi. is Ilona, Ilona Motionettes. And uh, yeah, we, we met at Legacy Effects five, five, six, years, six years ago. Sure, something like that. Somewhere about there, about six years ago. <laughs> okay. So I remember you guys we just like got married though. not too long ago. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've only been married for three years. Yes, three years. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. I remember seeing all those uh, pictures, and yeah, I remember seeing before you guys got married, you guys did Star Wars Day and stuff at, at, at Legacy, and you guys have oh, yeah. the best like, combination costumes, man. Those are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, she bought the shirts, the, uh, the Han Solo and Leia shirts, the uh, I Love You and I Know shirts. Oh, yeah. I, 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 you know, the funny thing was, is I, I would tell my wife, I love you. And she'd say, I know. And I thought that she was like, ah, that's the girl for me. Yeah. She's quoting Star Wars. She'd never seen it. She's just, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, well, perfect. What's, what's funny is he'll apologize for being a nerd about things like that. And I have to say, I mean, I worked with him for a year and a half before we started dating. I was very aware of what I was getting myself into. So he has yeah. nothing to apologize. Yeah. She, she saw my desk. With all my action figures and things like that. Like, so I'm, I'm a, you'll find out I'm a nerd, and it's like, oh, she probably knows. I do this for a living. Yeah. So tell us what you do for a living, because you guys met at work, and you are probably hands down the most accomplished seamstress 
paler. Paler. I, I don't know. A costumer. I don't know how you, how do you define <laughs> that? I wouldn't say that, but um, I was lucky enough to work at Legacy, which is um, full of amazingly talented people, I got to say. It's really one of the most talented group of people that you'll ever run into, and uh, also with a great sense of humor, everyone there. But um, I came into the fabrication department because a lot of the industry stuff this day is moving away from monsters and more into specialty costumes. So Legacy really specializes in doing a lot of robots and um, like video game costumes and things that are like spacesuits have been a really big thing. We worked on multiple spacesuit movies in the last year. We did, yeah, we worked on, you work on Pacific Rim too. Yeah. Right. A lot of things they call they joke about it like space marine costumes. You're yeah. either like in space marines or you're underwater space like marines. It's just everything is some form of armored something. So um, I think you know Ted has been there obviously a lot longer. I only worked at Legacy for about five years, but even in my time there, I saw the shift really towards. I think you know with the popularity of Avengers and all those superhero movies, it's like the whole costuming world has really moved towards that sort of specialty costuming. So they're need for more seamstresses grew, you know, as opposed to like having more people like Ted on board who are better at doing the creature effects and all that kind of stuff. Um, just the work that is out there is more costume based these days. So their fabrication department, I think has grown and changed a lot over the last several years oh, yeah. as a result of that. And that's where I came in um, is to help more with that level or that side of the fabrication. So you guys, both of you together that's that's quite a it's quite a combination you guys can do just about anything that comes at you i enjoy it because he's definitely (laughs) Uh he's got we have different strengths and that's a really great thing that's a great thing so there's a lot of stuff that i feel intimidated to do that ted can do with his eyes closed and i think there's stuff that he struggles with that is you know more my specialty so yeah together i think it's really it's a great combination well, how did you get there? What she said. Because you were in theater originally. Yeah, I well, I moved down to Los Angeles originally because I wanted to be a costume designer. And then I started going to school for that and realizing that being a high-level costume designer is very far removed from actually building anything. You spend a lot of time doing paperwork or shopping for things or just organizing and getting answers for people about, you know, choosing fabrics and things like that. So, and I realized that I really just would be sad if I wasn't actually building things. Um, So I started working in a costume shop, actually building stuff for theater. And I also really love period stuff. So for me, originally that was great. I worked for the Amundsen Theater. um, And, you know, I got to work on a lot of really beautiful period shows for a number of years, but then theater kind of tanked. So the last show that I had done there required a giant cactus walk around (laughs) for some odd reason. Um, And so the person who came in to consult us on that started his own company. So then I moved from there to the walk around world and I was there for a while. And through there, I met a group of- Explain that, walk around world. What's the walk around world, What's a walk around? (laughs) What's a walk around? Something from Australia. Yeah, were you, not a walk about, right? Oh, right. (laughs) Not a walk about, a walk around. Walk around. You you were building the the walk arounds? Yes, I worked for a company that made a lot of stuff for Disney and DreamWorks. So we, you know, would do stuff for the theme parks or DreamWorks had a big contract with Royal Caribbean where they had all of their, um, you know, characters on the cruise ships to do appearances and interact with the guests and stuff. So all like the characters from Madagascar or Shrek or things like that. So I worked for a company that would build those costumes um, for DreamWorks, maintain them, send them out. So I also got into doing some character performing because I happen to be the right size for a lot of walk around characters. So they need very short people. I'm only four two or five two. I'm not four two. <laughs> um, and so, and like Ted was saying, when you, four two. I'm sorry. There's nothing wrong with four two. Nothing wrong with five two. <laughs> nothing wrong with six two. It would. <laughs> Clothes would be a lot harder to find at four two. Although I guess I could shop in the children's section. Yeah, yeah. That would make things easier. <laughs> my wife shops in the, my wife shops in the children's section. That's <laughs> Yeah, well, the clothing Japanese. is cheaper. It's an advantage sometimes. <laughs> yeah, there's a great uh, there's a great podcast from ninety nine percent invisible on oh. uh, children's clothing and how that's decided and that kind of structure. It's fascinating stuff. That's a different subject altogether. But <laughs> awesome. You yeah. you went from theater to walk around. Yes. And 
walked all the way around to effects. Yeah, so it was one of those things where I met another group of really talented people. And, you know, when you're at a shop for several years, people end up migrating and going places. And um, my supervisor from that walk around shop ended up leaving and going to Legacy Effects. And so when, actually, first we both started working for ADI, Amalgamated Dynamics. And then um, when that job ended, she moved over to Legacy. And after a while, she brought me over into Legacy because she saw the need for more seamstresses there. So she brought me on board and, and that's where I stuck for five years until we decided to leave and start our own our own little shop here at home. So let's uh let's talk about that. What are you guys doing now? <laughs> what are we doing now? Um I mean like I, I mentioned earlier we got we've gotten to work on a few projects since I left. I've been gone for a year. She's been gone for about four four months. Yeah. So yeah about four months. And um, so we actually even prior to that we had done um, we were doing a lot of side work Ted because he's been in the industry for so long he gets was getting so many calls about side jobs um, mm -hmm. that but he couldn't take them because we were both working full time at Legacy working so. full time and like having to turn down jobs that could pay really well and do really neat projects you know, neat costumes and all that. And I would just be going, I hate turning this down. And then, you know, I took one of them. Luckily I was off for a short little bit. She wasn't. And then we ended up killing ourselves basically over these really great costumes. She did amazing leather work. They were for the, um, the video game God of War. Mm -hmm. And Oh, they, look at that face. So, <laughs> so they needed, um, they essentially walk around like live appearance costumes PlayStation did to take to conferences like E3 and all these other, you know, video game conference type things. So they have an actor who they use all the time as a uh, Kratos and then the Atreus character. So they have these two guys and they needed the costumes built for them. So that was one of our first big side jobs, side jobs that, you know, we got to build two sets of those. Two sets or three? Two sets, Two I sets, think. and then a modified version of the Kratos one that yeah. people could wear. Right, then there was, kind of, yeah, kind of a dumbed-down, easier version. Um, uh, there's some, something you said right there. I want to I uh, ask a second. You said multiple versions. Uh, you sometimes have to make multiple, multiple versions of a thing for film and TV and commercials. Right. And stuff. It's not like a cosplay where you make one and you got to... No, I mean this is, no. and they well, all have like, to be the, exactly the same. <laughs> yes, I mean most everything that we build. I mean at bare minimum for like a legacy, everything has a hero and a stunt. But you know you have something so like I mean, the is mean? a good example of some. Sorry. Well, so what's that mean? Hero and stunt. Hero is like the close-up shots. Yeah, exactly. Like the one that looks the prettiest, the one that's on the lead actor, the one that is you know meant for. The pretty shots and then you have the stunt one that either is meant for the scenes where someone's going to get beat up whether it's the same actor or whether it's a stunt double or someone like that so um like and sometimes those parts so if, you know we were saying is like the mandalorian um the the new tv show so there's the helmets that are the hard helmets and the hard pieces the plates and all that stuff so that would be hero because you want those things to look hard on camera and have some weight to them but then there's the, the stunt version that'll be made out of flexible urethane and those be cast in molds and all that sort of thing. The costumes don't change all that much as far as the fabric, but sometimes a hero becomes a stunt. You know, if it has to be the same thing, um, the same costume, you can beat up a hero enough that you hand it over to the stunt crew. It's like, okay, now they can beat that one up. But yeah, so that's the difference between those two costumes. But like anything, like Pacific Rim, or what else did we do over there? Mandalorian, or? Well, like Suicide Squad, yeah. we worked on recently, and like we made 12 or 14 suits for Idris Elba. That's a lot. That's wow. not normal, that is excessive. Usually productions are more on the stingy side, and they don't want to pay for, like the first season of Mandalorian, we made far more sets of that costume um, for the multiple people that they had playing the Mandalorian as opposed to the second season. 
they kind of scaled back on that because I think they were putting their funds into expanding it in other ways. Um, and it's for us as costume builders, especially because we have a lot of people, you know, like see, usually if you build a costume, I mean, we usually have some people from our shop that go and represent it on set or help maintain it on set or things like that. And like, we all know what's going to happen if they don't pay for enough, <laughs> if they don't have enough sets of that, then it becomes, you know, maintaining that costume and trying to keep the integrity of it over a shoot can become incredibly difficult. So we're all kind of bummed out, not because we just want the work, but also because we know what is going to happen to that costume over the life of the shoot. And so I was like, oh, I really wish they would pay for more because it's going to be so hard to maintain it when it, you know, they have one that falls apart and you're screwed. That's what a lot of people just in general, like your average film goer or television watcher Mm -hmm. doesn't understand usually how many costumes actually get made, you know, for a particular film. You know, if it's Spider-Man, if it's Superman or, or Iron Man or this or that, you know, I worked on Jingle All the Way or on Spawn. I worked on Spawn. I've got like, a picture of you with the, all the costumes from Tick I'm going to put up here. Um, there are like <laughs> yeah, six I mean, that's, that's a great example. That's a great example, yeah. too. Yeah, I, I give you that photo. And there, I think we built six or eight. And it's the exact same costume. Oh, so they're oh. painted the same, they're put together the same. You tell know, them how you clean it. What's that? Tell, you how, t tell everybody how you clean that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> cleaning wait. it? Oh, wait. Well, there's two different ways we can clean it. <laughs> so the one way, you know, when, when we're here in town and we don't have to ship things to a foreign country or even just take it halfway across the country, we, we have this material called NBAC. It's an aerosol can and it's an antibacterial spray. So that's just a very boring way of cleaning a suit. But then if you have to go across the ocean, you know, you're going to Europe, you're going to Asia or anywhere like that, and you can't take these aerosol cans on airplanes or anything like that. So when we land or before we land, we ask the production, please get us a whole lot of the cheapest vodka you can find. Mm -hmm. And we'll take that vodka and we pour it into like a little spritz bottle. And every now and again, we'll put some like vanilla extract in there to make it smell better. And so at the end of the day, when these guys, there you go. <laughs> at the end of the day, after these guys have like sweat really hard in these suits and they just smell terrible and they have to be disinfected, we use vodka. So they'll right. be in a spritzer and you can't do that second hand, right? You can't just give them the bottle and say, drink this, boys, and sweat that out into the suit. <laughs> I think it happened. Well, yeah. So we can't say who, <laughs> but we know a couple. I, I've seen a couple of actors sweat makeup off because there's a little bit too much alcohol in their system. Oh, oh that's some... right. Alcohol is activates uh, makeup that's used in movies. Right. So, yeah, yeah, for makeup remover. So I, I've I've yeah. seen actors sweat alcohol through their pores mm. that attack glues in costumes or the glues for prosthetics on their face. So yeah, it's it. I've seen it happen. I'm not going to name names, but I've seen it happen. <laughs> I mean, hilarious. you get to see everything. It's like I've, I've been dressing actors in costumes for a little over 30 years. And I've seen some, met and seen some of the best people and met and seen some of the worst things ever. <laughs> so, you know, we'll stick to like, the good. We'll stick to the good here. No, no we'll stick to yeah. the good. We'll stick to the good. But <laughs> we'll talk about hilarious. the good later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After show. After show. So I, I, I think it's important, especially for people to hear that, you know, beyond cosplay, that extra level of what you guys do, that the stunt and the hero look the same, but they're the different materials. One might be a fiberglass or metal or, or whatever, uh, even 3D printed, but the others could be foam. You know? Yeah, like Thor's hammer, because he was like flipping it around and uh, he said it was a... Uh, Ragnarok, which is the first one, was a 3D hammer where he wasn't doing, he didn't have anything in his hands. But until then, Chris said he had like stolen like 12 hammers. Some of them were foam. You could just kind of whack them over your head like a, right. like a kid's toy. And then some of them were like, you know, cold cast. Well, and so much these days too. I mean, we, we learned this doing all the Marvel films, like with the Iron Man costume. You know, the very first one that was built at Stan's, Stan Winston studio, it was a hard suit. It was a lot of fiberglass, a little bit of urethane, a lot of padding and all these different, you know, telescoping. You know, it, originally, if I, if I remember correctly, 
they weren't planning on having a guy in a suit ever. It was going to be a lot of digital, but I, I, I remember hearing John Favreau saying, well, we can definitely get a guy in the helmet, right? Because everything was designed in the computer and 3D modeled over stuntmen. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, yeah, we, we can definitely, you know, have a guy in the head on set and say, well, we can get a guy in the torso, can't we? By the end of that film, we had a guy head to toe in the Iron Man costume. And there's multiple shots in that first film that there's a guy in the whole suit. Now they went in and digitally replaced like in the elbows, um, in the knees where it's just fabric behind there. And then they added in metal pieces. But then so much as those films went on, even with the, uh, you know, the hero costumes, they would put the tracking dots all Mm -hmm. over the place. So if you're talking about, you know, Captain Shield or Thor's hammer or, you know, whoever's pieces like that, there's always orange tracking dots on that. So it can, it can be a crappy foam hammer that the paint is chipped on it. It's not looking great. And we don't do that at Legacy or we didn't. We didn't do um, those kind of props. Those were other companies that did those props. But there's always tracking dots on that. So whether it's like the really great hero one that you see, they'll even put tracking dots on that. And they're, everything's always cleaned up in post. Everything always has some digital on it on post nowadays. Yeah, I remember seeing the um, the Mark II of of Iron Man in the movie when he's getting ready to test his first flight. It's a you know the camera goes around and a lot of it is it's this practical suit. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody's in or not, but then they then all the little flaps and things that go to it are all digital and it the what? melding of that. No, no, uh, that. That suit was a practical suit, and that was on an actor, but then they digitally started moving all the plates. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was, you know, so they'll put the tracking dots on there again, and then sometimes it's just a matter of erasing the tracking dot if they're not going to move that piece, but Mm -hmm. the digital artists need to be able to key in on that. Mm -hmm. So when you see those plates moving, you know, those are digital but then it morphs back into the actual physical suit that we built. So, I mean, that's some of the really great stuff that I like seeing happen is a, is a great melding and marriage <laughs> between digital and practical, right. you know, because when you completely get away from the practical and digital takes over, the audience knows it. You end yeah. up with cat. Yeah. You, mm, <laughs> yeah. We, we watched cat a couple of weeks ago. Oh. Not a good idea. Don't watch cat. Oh. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, my kids keep uh, my daughter and I say no 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, my daughter no. said the same thing I watch that absolutely not get, get, just have a big drink first that mug full of vodka will yeah. serve you well then it might actually I, be fun I can't so we that to my kids into, we should turn it into a drinking game <laughs> yeah, exactly every time well, you see a, a digital effect you have a drink oh no that's what we did oh, no, for no. predators <laughs> and that just that, that led to a bad night <laughs> <laughs> No, but I mean, I like to see that nice marriage between the, the two, you know, where they'll say, you know, we'll have VFX people come to us and say, oh, no, 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 leave the helmet the way it is. Leave the, 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 the chest plate and the arms. We're just going to replace this middle section because everything else looks great. Or they can make some little piece pop or something like that. You know, digital will be happy to do that. But more times than not, digital usually wants as much practical there as possible because it's less work for them. Yeah, I've done a lot of uh, that digital. And if you don't have the practical there, you don't have any idea what it's going to look like on film because you don't have any reference to it. I mean, this stuff is out right. of the world reference. And if you don't have you know, a clue as to what the, the material is going to ref- the reflection, the specularity, yeah. all this kind of stuff, you need something there that can play off. And on top of that, there's a, a level of reality that, um, won't transfer to digital like when Iron Man's moving and stuff you have to like bend physics to a certain amount for his arm to be able to come like this because you know for goodness sake you can't comb your own I mean you're wearing a helmet but you can't comb your own hair because you can't bend your arm those metal plates cross each other and you can only do that digitally and you kind of have to fudge it to show that. Yeah they cheated a lot yeah you know that's fine you know cheated a bit but use our suit too at the same time 
that's one of the things that legacy that I did a lot of, and I was on every incarnation of these commercials was the Kia hamsters. Oh yeah. Those are great. So I don't know if you guys know, you know, the, the, so anyhow, the key, yeah, there was a huge campaign for a long time for the hamsters. So the very first Kia hamsters that I worked on, it was all blue screen. So I built basically like a fat suit out of foam. And then we covered those fat suits in blue spandex. So they wore blue heads and they had these little blue cages that stuck out with all the motion tracking dots on it. And so every time they moved, they would track the motion, but then they had to put their digital on top of the blue. And sometimes they had to erase the blue. Right. So right, right. what they started doing on each commercial, the digital effects guys, because they had to replace the hamster's hands too, all the fur. And mm -hmm. they said, the performers blew fingers are getting in the way because they're not quite doing exactly what we need them to do or the fur you know that's around the bottom or something isn't quite and they started asking us can't we put fur on the legs and on the bottom and we we're like yeah of course we can so right. we got fur from national fiber technology which is on the east coast in uh, maryland i think and so you know we worked with with them at nft getting the right colors, the right textures and all that stuff. And so we did the, it, whenever it was blue originally, now it was real fur. And so the right. VFX guy that said, great, now we don't have to do fur on the bottom half or we don't have to do fur on the body or the arms. Right. And then we started doing fur gloves, you know, so if they're wearing jackets, you know, the hamsters were wearing jackets and all that kind of stuff, we would do the gloves then. We started doing these really nice silicone pads that were glued to gloves and then we had the really nice fur backing so you have fur silicone latex uh, spandex all these materials that are going at once and right. the, the kind of the background that you have to have it's just years and years of experience but to get into this people should just try to use whatever they have and and experiment with it to it's all experimentation and, and, and research too. I mean, a lot of the people that, especially that are in like the, um, like the casting rooms and the molding rooms, you know, so the guys that work in the mold shop are constantly experimenting with new materials, new, new glues, new urethanes, new, uh, you know, hard casting materials and soft casting materials. And then there's the guys that work in the rooms where they're doing all the, um, the foam latex, you know, and so much foam latex has been replaced now with silicones and, and softer urethanes and things like that. Um, so they're doing a lot of that experimentation and then that will filter up to fabrication. Um, well, I think in general, the thing that I always find amusing about our industry, you know, for as long as we've both been working in it, it's like every time I still get a piece of concept artwork, generally my reaction is, oh how are we gonna build that, that yeah. <laughs> but the difference is now i have more faith in my ability to figure it out so i'm not as terrified as i used to be but you know i i like the fact that after 30 years or 15 years or 25 or however long five you know everybody is still the problem solving never goes away and that's what makes it interesting for me you know what mm -hmm. i mean so it's not like you reach this plateau where you know how to build that it's like but you know the more different costumes you have to build you can pull on different resources We're like well that one time we had to do this and we can take that piece of knowledge from that job and we can take this piece of knowledge from this job and and that and that's what you build up your library of resources becomes bigger but the problem solving never goes away you know so right. I, I, think, I think you just hit the theme of this whole podcast i mean that's yeah. what I, I i've been in animation for 25 years and I still get excited by these new concepts or a new program, or even they'll, they'll throw me something. And I, go, I have no idea how to do that, but I always say yes. Yeah. Oh, that's always the key thing. It's like I, my, my first days at uh, Steve Johnson's shop, I worked at uh, Edge Effects for Steve for six years, I think, and I worked on a, a fabulous movie called Monkey Bone. Go watch it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I that, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, Brendan <laughs> Franklin. And then we were working on um, working on Monkey Bone, and I had some interesting concepts that I wanted to try with some of these suits. And Steve came up to me and he goes, 
hey, now these are really different. I hadn't seen, you know, something quite like this before. You know, do you, how are you going to approach this? And I just blah, 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 blah. Here's how I'm going to do it. If you tried this before, I said, oh, yeah. He goes, oh, what did you, I said, oh, k and I did something like that. I said, honestly, way back at John Beekler's shop, I tried something like that too. He goes, oh, okay, cool. And he turned around and the supervisor, Fernando uh, Favela, asked me, he goes, really? He said, you've done something like that before? He said, oh, no, I've never done it before. I said, but I'm, I'm fairly certain it's going to work. And <laughs> Fernando was just like, I like you. I like the way you're. And that was my mantra. first week at Steve's. So. I have this mantra going in my head every time somebody hands me a new job. I was like, oh, please, Lord, don't let them know. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, no, that's the thing nobody yeah. does. I mean, you never, because yeah. every company is slightly different. So, and, yeah. you know, this, the filming circumstance might be different, the expectations, whatever. So it's like, you always, I mean, it's always slightly unknown, no matter how much experience you have. Yeah, you know you can yeah. get it done. It can be done. It's just that finding it out is actually that journey, finding it out is for me why I do a lot of what I do. Because exactly. I think that's where a lot of the creativity comes in because I mean, ultimately at the end of the day, especially when you're working on high profile projects, it's like you don't get to be creative in the traditional sense and that you're not designing something. You're not, you know, your creativity really comes in when it, with the problem solving of how do I take this piece of artwork that's been handed down from, Marvel or Lucas or whatever, and how do I make that a functioning thing on a human right. who will survive wearing it? <laughs> right. Like one of the first jobs that was presented to me at John Beekler's um, was this gag in a movie called uh, The Lawnmower Man. I remember that. Movie. I remember that. Yeah. Virtual yeah. reality movie. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a crazy movie, but uh, John gave me this very specific gag to do in the film, and I. I tried coming up with all kinds of different ways to do this. And he actually even put me on the phone with Dick Smith one of the days and it's like, call Dick and Dick will tell you, you know, what to do. And, you know, he sent me some stuff. And to this day though, there'll be some new material. There'll be something that I see at the shop and I go, Oh my God, I could have used this 30 years ago on the lawnmower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, all, yeah. So you're always learning and there's always that one gag that gets away from you and just kind of, He's like, oh, that could have been better, but you find some material like 10 years later, 30 years later, and going, oh, why didn't I have this then? So uh, that's, it's, it's fun, though, because you find it and you remember it, and, you know, I can use that in the future on something else. Excellent. It has been fantastic talking to you guys. And um, before we go, you guys are, how, how can we contact you? How do you want people to contact you? Do you want people to contact you? you said, no, stay away. My phone contact. number is 818. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I, I've been really, I've been really active on Instagram. So I'm Ted Haynes Foam Faber on Instagram and I'm Ted Haynes um, Foam Fabricator on Facebook. Um, I'll have a website up soonish. Um, so, you know, if you go to my Instagram, uh, phone Faber, or if you go to the, uh, the Facebook page, uh, Ted Haynes, phone Faber, phone fabricator, you know, all the info will be there soon enough. You know, the website. Will okay. Go and up. you guys are in the LA area. Are you moving? Or are you staying around? No, we're, we're, we're in the LA area. Um, you know, in the hub. We're in Burbank, so I mean, we're right there next to Universal Studios and Warner Brothers and NBC and Disney, and so we're right in the middle of all that. Right. Excellent. Thank, thank you them. so much. It's been an oh, absolute pleasure, and uh, we can't thank you enough for coming on, and uh, we look forward to seeing more from you guys as, uh, yeah. as time goes on. Yeah, this has been a real, <laughs> it's been a real honor, and it's been a pleasure. So oh sure no no worries guys I mean this is it's fun it's fun to show up and and talk about what we do because we both we love making stuff you know making things I've been doing it she's been doing it forever all the stories she's told me about making jewelry and sculptures from when she was a kid and I did the same thing and yeah. you know trying to sell comic books in the fourth grade and <laughs> you know it's just you know, it's what we do. So we love talking about it and, and sharing it with everybody. And, you know, it's part of why I have the two different platforms where I can share what I'm doing and, and kind of teach it and answer okay. questions about it. So uh, for everybody listening, I want to thank you guys. Make sure you check the, the show notes down at the bottom and we'll have links to all these things that uh, Ted has listed here. And uh, 
See you next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.